Okay, so so far we dealt with really boring stuff. So this was essentially state of the art, 1950-1960, right? Um, so we need to move slowly to the 70s, and so I hope that by the end of today we will have reached the 70s. So in order to do so, let's first actually look at a little bit <clears throat> what people in the 50s did with neural networks. And so for that, we need to look at the perceptron and what Mr. Rosenblatt did and all of that. And then we'll take care of the multilayer perceptron. So this is the Mark I perceptron, 1960. It's a nice space heater. <laughs> and yeah, so Bitcoin miners are small by comparison. But anyway, so there's the perceptron, right? So if we've already seen this a few times. So I, my output is some nonlinear function of the inner product between, let's say, w and x, and then I have some constant, and let's say it's one if it's you know if it's positive and zero otherwise. Okay, so this is nothing very special. And mind you, I mean, this is like, there are three different ways how you can look at this, right? So binary classification just outputs a zero, one. But you could also have, you know, a real value scalar term for regression, or you could have probabilities. And I mixed up those two lines. Okay, so uh, that'll be fixed in the slides later. But if you look at what kind of decision boundaries you can get with this linear function, well, if I have the normal equation for a plane, which this really is, if I require that w dot x plus b equals zero, then I get any one of those lines. And so I could, for instance, classify ham from spam if I want to do spam filtering, and this is with a simple linear function. A uh, quick question. Out of all those classifiers, which one do you like best? Who likes the red one best? Hey, red is a nice color, right? Okay. Okay, nobody likes red here. Okay, how about purple? Okay. How about black? Okay. How about green? Okay. So, why did you all raise your hands for green? Because I asked for it last? No. So, why, why, why do you like green best? Yes? It like, maximizes the margin, so it's like farther from Correct. So it maximizes the margin of separation from any of the two classes. Now, if you had done your PhD in the 90s, this would have led to support vector machines and all sorts of things. And basically, the way how to make this nonlinear would have been to map the entire data into some nonlinear representation space. But since this is now, you know, almost, you know, it's 2019 now. So you would do things by finding a good embedding of the data, which actually is the same thing as mapping it into this nonlinear space, except that you're learning that entire embedding. So if you want to have a difference between kernels and neural networks, in one case, the engineer invents the embedding. In neural networks, we learn it. In any case, um, this is a good way of separating data. And it works quite well. Now, how would you train such a thing? And this is an algorithm. This is probably the first deep learning algorithm ever. Right? This is the perceptron algorithm of Frank Rosenblatt. It goes as follows. Initialize W and B equals zero. <clears throat> and then iterate to the data. Whenever you get something wrong, so W dot X plus B times YI less equal than zero. So that means I'm on the wrong side of the margin of the separator. Then add yi times xi to the weight vector and add yi to the bias. And you keep on doing this until everything is classified correctly. So this is the same thing as performing stochastic gradient descent with batch size 1 with this loss function. Let me draw it for you.
this is the last function that I'm using. Well, actually, to be correct, this is the last function. So here I'm plotting y i times f of x i. And here's the, sorry, that y times f, and this is the loss. And so if y times f is greater or equal than 0, it means that I'm predicting you know, class 1, and the label is 1, so everything's good. If I'm here, it means that label and, class and prediction don't match, and then I incur a loss that's proportional to how badly I get it wrong. Now, of course, the derivative of that is this function here. In other words, you get an update by just the observation that you have, or you get no update at all. Okay. Everybody's cool with that algorithm? Okay. So this is shamelessly stolen from Wikipedia. Let's say I want to separate cats from dogs. I have some separator. I get a new observation. I change the classifier. Keep on doing this, and yeah, eventually I get that. So there's actually a theorem. And that theorem is exactly in terms of the margin of separation. And so I've got the large margin cat and dog separator um, with you know, exactly that width. And basically, the theorem says, if I can bound my data within some radius r, and if for a unit vector, w, so norm of w squared plus b squared less equal than 1, so if I can find some weight vector and bias combination that's less equal than 1 in terms of overall length, then I'm guaranteed that the perceptron will converge after r squared plus 1 over rho squared update steps. Not number of observations, but update steps. So why is it update steps rather than number of observations? Okay. Have you ever been in a terribly boring lecture? Right? So if you ever were in a terribly boring lecture, you learned nothing new. And so you didn't learn anything. You didn't update your internal model. On the other hand, if you're in an interesting, exciting lecture, then you will very often have to update your inner model of how the world works, you will update your parameters. So I hope that Mu and I fall into the latter category, so you will converge rapidly. <laughs> but uh, I mean, hey, we're trying, right? So <clears throat> now let's actually see how this works in practice. Uh, by the way, just one quick insert before we do this. Um, so there's this game called black and white. You guys probably don't remember it, and the gaming studio actually went bust after this. And so this game, so I'm telling you this because this is one of the very first applications of machine learning in a computer game. Um, so the thing was you basically played God, and you had this avatar, and the avatar would try to do and mimic what you were doing. And your goal was to teach the avatar to be Benevolent if you want to play benevolent god, or evil if you want to be evil. So you could smash the villagers, or you could feed them, right? Stuff like this. So what they did is they used a perceptron algorithm to learn, based on you know contextual parameters and so on, what the avatar should do. Now, <clears throat> this would have worked really nicely were if humans were actually consistent. Turns out humans aren't always consistent, at least not in the representation space picked by the game designers. And so what happened is that basically the algorithm which should have converged towards a avatar that's very beautifully trained didn't converge to that and the game just progressively became harder and harder to play. Which is probably one of the reasons why you haven't heard of this game. So, Bad machine learning actually ruined the entire game studio. So don't do that. OK, so now before we go to the XOR problem, we 
actually, I'll leave you with that for now, for a moment. Um, and then we'll look at the examples. So um, there was this AI winter around the early 70s. And this was due to those two guys, Minsky and Papert. And what they proved is that if I have a simple XOR problem, my perceptron cannot learn it. Basically, if I align the reds and green dots this way, I cannot find any line that will happily separate those into reds and greens separately. So that sounds you know, like a pretty fundamental flaw to neural networks. And yeah, that book pretty much set back machine learning by like five to 10 years. And of course, there's a nice solution to that, because otherwise we wouldn't be teaching machine learning now. Uh, but let's actually look at the perceptor and how it works. So this is really just OK. Let's import the data just as I would. And now to make things interesting, I need to create some separable training problem. And I'm just going to create some random data. So now in order to make this problem separable, so first of all, OK, I create you know, a random weight vector, W fake and B fake. And then I make sure I rescale it. OK, so this is essentially you know, you know, weight and bias. <coughs> and then I go and create random data, so the x's and the y's. And I go through all the data, and I check whether the data can be accurately classified into, let's say, ones or minus ones, according to W. And if not, then I throw it out. Otherwise, I keep it. So I basically assign it a label, one or minus one. And if it's too close to the margin, I just throw it out. So that's essentially all I'm doing. So that's what this epsilon does, right? So this is the margin as scalar greater than epsilon. So the margin is basically in a product here at scale. And so if, if, it's if I cannot separate it confidently, I throw it out. Otherwise, I add it to my training set. Okay. And so that's my data generator. It generates fake data. Okay. And then, well, what I need, I need some plotting routine. I need to know, I need to get the contour plots, because otherwise I can't really tell exactly you know, how well converged I am. Because, OK, so that's that. That's kind of vanilla. I don't think there's anything particularly exciting in there that we need to cover. And so now, if I wanted to run this, oops, it's not very good. It basically created only data of one class. Yeah, so here we have some data, red and blue dots, that are reasonably well separable. OK, so now let's actually implement the perceptron algorithm. And this perceptron algorithm does exactly what I described. If y times inner product between w and x plus b is less equal than 0, perform an update and say that I made, made a mistake, otherwise return zero and do nothing. OK, so I start with W and B set to zero, and I iterate through the data. And so basically, I just you know, perform a perceptron update. And if I encounter an error, I print up my parameters, and then I just keep on updating things. Now for that, let me quickly zoom back to the regular mode because it will not show very nicely otherwise. OK. So let's run this code. So initially, it doesn't do very much. This is my classifier. And this green dot is what I misclassified so I get the separator. Of course, that's not particularly interesting. 
So let's see what happens after I get one more observation. Okay, here's another green dot. So now this is positive class. So now my classifier already starts looking a little bit closer to what I should have gotten. Okay, after the next mistake, this one here, it starts separating the data quite nicely. So we're pretty much done, except that the bias is wrong. Okay, see so another observation. Okay, updates this. Another one, updates that. Another one here. And yeah, okay, so I'm done going over the data. If I went through it another time, it would be converged. So this is the perceptron algorithm in action. I've basically shown you every single error that it made after one pass of the data. Any questions so far? Okay, so now one thing that's kind of interesting is to check whether, you know, how difficult I make the problem actually has any bearing on how many updates I need to make. So what I'm doing is I basically just pick a range between, you know, 0 0.25 and 0, point, 0, point, sorry, 0 0.025 and 0 0.45 as the range of parameters for the margin. So large margin means easy problem, narrow margin means difficult problem, right? And then I just go and actually generate random data, do that a few times, run the perceptron algorithm, count how many times it takes until it's done, and then I plot this. So I'm not going to run this piece of code right now because this would take a while because it's very inefficiently written. But if you ran it and waited for a while, you will get this curve. So remember where we had the perceptron conversion theorem where we had basically, you know, radius of a margin, right? This is exactly that bound now in practice. But of course, in reality, it's a little bit better than the worst case bound, but you can still see the same behavior. Namely, you can see that as the margin gets wider, the number of updates decreases. So for a very simple problem, I might need only maybe four or five updates in order to converge. Whereas for a really difficult problem, I might need, you know, 20, 30, 40 updates. Okay. Um, any more questions about the perceptron? Okay. <laughs>